Hello, welcome to Just To Be Nominated, a podcast about movies distributed by Lee Enterprises. The show is hosted by Bruce Miller, an entertainment reporter from multiple decades who is currently the editor of the Sioux City Journal, Jared McNett, a reporter for the Globe Gazette in Mason City, Iowa, and me, Chris Lay, the podcast operations manager for Lee. This week's big release is a Broadway adaptation, Dear Evan Hansen, which despite winning a pile of Tony Awards, has been a lightning rod for controversy and racked up generally unfavorable reviews, one of which comes from our very own Bruce Miller. Also on the slate is Birds of Paradise, a teen drama set in a French ballet school, which fared a bit better. This week marks the 20th anniversary of Zoolander, so we decided to spend the staff picks section mulling over some of the finer work from Ben Stiller's back catalog. We even went so far as to toss out a deep cut by way of a failed TV pilot, which is truly one of the furthest out there shows to ever even get that far in the production process. Then finally, we take a look at the latest movie news. You can find links to all the movies that we talk about in the show notes, along with links to our social media, etc., to see what we're up to and or contact us if you want to sound off in our DMs. If you like the show, please tell your movie-loving pals about us and let us know what you think in the review section of the show wherever you get your podcasts. Now, here it is. Our show kicks off after this short pause. Hey, Chris. Yeah, what's up? Do you ever notice that um, you drive in a parkway, but you park in a driveway? All right. Oh, hey. <laughs> So we got we're sitting on almost George Carlin turf there. So we've got Jared McNett out in Mason City, cracking wise. We got Bruce out in Sioux City. I'm behind the bar and I'll be serving up drinks all night. So just come on by and make sure you tip your waiters. Try the veal. When I am Chris, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. And let's start off. Uh, Bruce, what have you seen? recently that you want to pitch out there are we talking dear evan hansen you know what let's go ahead let's and start let's go yeah, ahead let's, let's go ahead and talk about dear this. evan hansen i have been waiting for this since i saw dear evan hansen on broadway with ben platt and i thought oh this is gonna be such a good movie and then they started announcing the names you go amy adams oh my god she's perfect for that julianne moore yes and then you watch it on the screen and you go oh my god what happened and when I think did you big... start, when did you start hearing that this was going to be a little bit of a mess? Oh, it's been at least six months because people were questioned. And when they put the first trailer out, they all go, how old is he? That was the big kind of tip off. And you know what? This is my take on all of this. As much as Ben Platt would have wanted to play the part on screen, they really shouldn't have let him do it because the screen is unforgiving. And for you to try and pass yourself off as a high school kid is really difficult. I think they would have been much better off if they had, if they really wanted to capture his performance, they should have done like Hamilton, done a stage thing, had that, put that away, they're good. But I think the memory of what you saw on stage is far greater than what you see on film. And I hate to see that ruined because he was spectacular on stage. I mean, spectacular. He was worth every dime I spent to see that. And when you see him in film, it's like, geez, I could see like 10 other kids who could play this and be even better. And I think that's where it goes wrong is that his father produced it. His father made sure he got to do it. And I don't know that it really works. Uh, Dear Evan Hansen is based on a musical. Was it written? by Ben Platt? No, uh, Pasek and Paul. And they're two um, kind of up and coming. They've won an Oscar already and they won a Tony for Dear Evan Hansen. So they're like the up and coming team on Broadway where you go, oh my God, it's a Pasek and Paul show. You know, kids, if they're theater kids, they're into the things that they write. They also did a Christmas story for stage. Um, they did... Um, uh, La La Land, the music for that and won an Oscar for that. They did The uh, Greatest Showman 
And they've got other things that are in the, the works. I, I'm sure they're gonna be up with two more films for Oscars this year, but they know how to kind of touch a younger audience. And so that's, it's great. But there are just too many things that are, are tied to the past with this kind of stuff. You know, people walking down a hall and breaking into song works in some situations, but this is a kid who has social anxiety disorder. So the idea that you would see him singing out loud down the hallway is kind of stupid. Um, and I would not, you know, there are choices here that, no. The kid who plays the kid who's dead, Connor, is really good. And actually he was, I believe, an understudy for um, Dear Evan Hansen on, on Broadway. Um, but he does a great job as Connor. The plot is full on, disturbing almost it's young adult kind of angsty stuff um he uh, evan hansen has a cast because he broke his arm falling off a tree or whatever and he wears the cast and his mom says you know maybe you could meet people if you asked him to sign your cast and so he goes to school with a sharpie and this connor um is kind of a bully kind of a kid that nobody likes he grabs the pen out and scrawls Connor on his cast. And then what you next find out is, and steals a, um, it's some worksheet that Evan had to do for his therapist. Um, the next thing you know, Connor is dead. And he's, Evan's got this big old cast with Connor on it. And Connor's parents think that they were good friends. And they find this letter that Evan actually wrote to himself. It's one of those things, dear, you know, if I said, dear Bruce Miller, you're going to be great today. Your day is going to be fine. It's kind of a motivational thing. Well, they find that on Connor and they think that he was writing this letter to give to Evan Hansen and that they were really these kind of good buds that were shoring each other up. And when the kid, when Evan realizes that the parents really need some kind of reassurance that their kid wasn't a loser wasn't uh you know whatever he goes along with it and pretends like they were friends so it's it's an interesting premise but it's really dark because you're you're cheering on somebody who's big basically a liar and should you really be you know in his camp with that i don't know and then the sister you know is a girl that evan has been longing for a long time she shows interest in him it just snowballs. And then there are kids at school who are big about um, causes and whatnot. And so they start a Connor project and it goes viral. And how do you pull all this back and admit to everybody, I've been lying. So that's the premise of the whole thing. It's weird to like, cause I only knew the name of this for the longest time and didn't know the premise. It's weird hearing like the, the premise more now and like being a big fan of the movie uh, World's Greatest Dad with Robin Williams, because it's kind of a similar plot, plot to that movie, because that's also in a high school where like his kid dies and then he lies about why his, or how his kid died to just like be more liked in the high school. <laughs> I'm glad that you got there because I was going to, I think, lead up to that a little bit. Yeah, World's Greatest Dad from 2009, which is I think five or six years before Dear Evan Hansen premiered. Directed by Bobcat Goldthwait, stars Robin Williams. A pitch black comedy. Yeah, the world's greatest dad is Robin Williams in that film, whose son is a horrible, bad person. Just one of the worst people. Yeah, who dies in a uh, accidental autoerotic asphyxiation uh, accident. Yep. <laughs> and the father, who is a an English teacher at the school. And not a well-liked one. He is a, a failed novelist or an aspiring yep. novelist. And <laughs> so to, to save face, he writes a suicide note and then reframes the entire thing. And it's basically him having to deal with all of the, the fallout from that. Jared, you are not the first person to, to make that comparison. I think I've actually heard, you know, Bobcat, uh, Goldthwait basically say that, you know, he, he really liked Dear Evan Hansen when, when he made it. <laughs> so yeah, world's greatest dad, not for everybody, but 
sounds like maybe for more people than Dear Evan Hansen is. Well, and it's trying to attract the young adult audience, you know, the ones who like fault in our stars and that kind of stuff. And I think it falls short of that. I really do. Um, the guy who directed it uh, did Perks of Being a Wallflower. Based on a book that he wrote. Yeah. You can see where there's probably some synergy, but there are a lot of musts with this show. And if you don't have this and you don't have that, it really doesn't. It isn't Evan Hansen. Listen to the soundtrack. The music is good. So that's Dear Evan Hansen. You know, I, I was waiting for this one. I was it's like well, on the top of my list because I enjoyed the play so much. And I thought, I can hardly wait to see what they've done with this. And I'm a big advocate of preserving performances if they were really good on Broadway. I like that concept. But when there's an age factor involved, that's where it becomes, wait a minute here, you can't. And it's not like nobody else could do it. There have been younger people than Ben Platt who have played the role on Broadway and gotten great reviews. One of whom is actually dating Ben Platt, I believe. Noah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew Barth Feldman, a kid who won the Best High School Performer Award. He was on Broadway in it when I think he was 16. Perfect, would have been perfect for this. Um, but, you know, and in, in New York, there are a lot of young very, very talented kids. It isn't like you go, oh my God, we can't find one. There's nobody who could actually play this. There's a lot of kids who could play that. But I guess it's, you know, it's payback. You just say, you did it, you did it well. He won a Grammy, an Emmy, and a Tony for playing Dear Evan Hansen. Now, how do you do that? Well, A, you do, you win the Tony because you're on stage, okay. The Grammy came from the soundtrack uh, or the original Broadway cast album. So you get a Grammy for that. Okay. And then you happen to show up on the Today Show some morning and you sing a song from Dear Evan Hansen and they give you an Emmy for it. Best variety performance during a daytime TV show. I didn't know that was an award that you can get an award for a on a talk show. Yeah. Isn't that cheap? They shouldn't count as an EGOT. I swear, if you have a TV, daytime TV E, it shouldn't count. But he's got everything but the O, and I'm sure they thought this was going to be his O. I've gone on record as being a loud and proud fan of Cats as not necessarily bad cinema, but just an example of something that worked on stage and was impossible to transfer and honestly is also based on something that should never have had a musical based on it in the first place and once it's brought into the broader awareness and it's not just theater kids that are having to confront wait you mean there's no plot it's just cats talking about going to heaven and explaining what they do and that's it like and Who's the old cat? We don't know. <laughs> like, what's the what's the deal with any of this? And it seems like Dear Evan Hansen falls into that where a lot of people didn't know the plot and all of a sudden get to find out what it's about. And they go, oh, really? <laughs> um, and I don't know, it's just kind of a bummer because it doesn't seem like it lends itself to the, I don't want to say hate watch, but the you know like the so bad it's good kind of stuff yeah 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 no it's not that it's not that it falls short in too many where areas and it's good in some areas where you go amy adams is pretty darn good she could be doing a hillbilly elegy here and get a nomination that could happen but a lot of it really and you question why why it didn't need to be that way I'll talk about cats for a second here because I'm excited for this. Yeah. Certain things belong on stage only. And when you see somebody leaping across a stage and they're doing these great dance moves, you go, wow. When you see the same thing happen on film, you go, oh, they cut it. They just cut it until they got it right. And so there isn't that wow factor of being there and seeing that and enjoying what you're getting. You're just, we're jaded because we've seen so much you know, special effects work. We've seen um, great editing with things. And movies are a real ferocious beast. When they come up very close on somebody's face, you don't look at the face. You look at the bad makeup. And I think that's where 
a lot of the times you can't just translate it like they do. Hamilton was a really good example of what you could do. Hamilton may fall flat as a regular movie. You know, if they do it as a movie where we're going to cast oh, Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise in this thing, and we're going to do it out on real locations, it could be just a dud. But when the way they did it, where you got the kind of the sense, the excitement of, of the stage, it works. So anyway, that's my rant. Some things don't need to be on film. Agree. 100%. Jared? Yes. You've seen some good stuff lately? I have. I'll start with the, wait, have you also seen Cop Shop, Chris? I have not seen Cop Shop. It is on my list. I'll start with that one then. I uh, saw that last night and had a lot of fun with it. It's just a good, like, pulpy, like, 70s throwback movie where, uh, among others, Gerard Butler fully in his like scumbag era now to the point where like someone in the movie as like a like barb at him while they're already in jail says that he looks like a stepdad which is just perfect that's how his era should be described now like gerard butler in action movies now looks like a just a loudish stepdad which is perfect for him he's the opposite of bruce's uh single dad with kids on the weekend movie yeah yeah, he is. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, it was fantastic. It had some like assault on precinct 13 type vibes. I didn't realize that like pretty much the entire movie is just at like a police station. There's not really any other locations, which I really loved. And then, uh, yeah, in particular, one of the great uh, turns in it was uh, Toby Huss, who people my age might know from uh, the adventures of Pete and Pete. Uh, he's also been in a lot of like TV shows, including uh, other TV shows too. He was in some HBO stuff. He's in Halt and Catch Fire, which we talked about. Very much a that guy. Yep. He's in the newer uh, Halloween movie. Um, I don't know if he's going to be in the one this year or not. Yeah. He plays an absolute psychopath in uh, Cop Shop, a psychopath with like a mustache and a weird like Southern accent and it's delightful. And then someone who I was completely unfamiliar with that ends up stealing the whole movie is this actress named Alexis Louder, uh, who was in a movie earlier this year, The Tomorrow War, which we mostly, I think, made fun of. I didn't even actually watch it, but it looked really bad. Um, she's fantastic in, in Cop Shop and ended up being the, the best takeaway from it. Although, again, Gerard Butler needs to do mo more movies where he's a total scumbag because it always works. Cop Shop. Yeah. Top shot. Fun to say. Now. I hope it's the eyes of Tammy Faye. Well, I was going to let Jared roll a little bit further and roll he will because there's a lot of driving in this movie. Yes. You have been building up to Cry Macho for weeks. Oh. Rewatching and, and watching for the first time a whole bunch of later period and mid period, I suppose, Clint Eastwood directorial efforts. Let's call them. <laughs> so, Jared, what was your take on Cry Macho? Which I, I also saw. Bruce, did you see it? You bet. Uh-oh. I saw part of Bruce's uh, review for Cry Macho. Now, I, I really, really liked the movie quite a bit. The fairest way to describe, like, Clint Eastwood at this point with his movies is that he's clearly been slowly kind of whittling away at, you know, parts of what his movies have been for a while. And, like, there's not a lot of like extra varnish on his movies at this point. And this one is, is great proof of that. Like there's literally a point in the movie where he, where he just like takes a nap and that's like a little part of the movie. And basically I guess I didn't realize how much of the movie would end up just being a road trip movie as much as anything. It's more of a road trip movie than even a Western. I think, even though it takes place in Mexico and everything like that, I think the strongest part of the movie, which, I mean, I don't think this is much of a spoiler is once the movie really settles into this like town in Mexico that they have to stay at for a while, that was the part of the movie that I think worked the most. And that was really when everything kind of clicked into gear in that movie for me, because he like um, starts, you know, kind of getting back into his old uh, habits, but in a, like a better kind of more positive way. And he like bonds more with this kid that he has to take care of. And he even, uh, find someone that he uh, makes a connection with who is also a uh, widower like him. So that part of the movie in particular was like the really, really strong stuff, I thought. The Bridges of Madison County part 
where he hits on this lady who runs a cafe that nobody goes to. <laughs> yep. The chairs are always put up where there's like, is anybody coming to this restaurant? It looks kind of bad. Here's his de dear Evan Hansen. He's too old to be playing this part. At one point, he's trying to teach the kid how to break a wild horse. And you know it's a stunt man getting on a horse for him, but you're supposed to believe that he's riding this wild bronc. Right. This is happening. Um, I look at this thing and I think, how lazy can you be? There'll be a, 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 a statement like, well, I guess we should get going. And then they get in the car and go. And there's this whole series of them stealing cars that never seems to be addressed properly. Aren't you, are there no rules in Mexico? You can steal any car you want and it's okay. It's the seventies, you know, you can steal whatever car you want. Just right. Take cars I remember the seventies. I was in the seventies. This is not the seventies. It's weird. And then Dwight Yoakam, could you possibly read your script? He's looking down the whole time. Well, now, why don't you go get my son? He's in Mexico. His wife, my ex-wife is an alcoholic. Get him away from her. There is nothing there that he brings to the table. Nothing. And Dwight Yoakam used to be a good actor. He is a reader now. And he's just reading the script. And it's, ugh. So I'm sorry, Jerry, that you liked it. I get the idea that it's an old man reflecting on his past. But I got that from... Um, the Mule, and I got that from uh, Grand Torino, which I think is a much better look at an older person kind of bonding with a younger person. This, geez, they even throw in cockfights. Now, come on, do we need that? I don't think we need that. And the rooster gets the best scene. That was low key another one of my favorite things in the movie. It's just like Clint Eastwood, and which definitely just feels like an old Hollywood kind of thing is so great acting with animals in this movie. He's great acting with the rooster. He's great acting with any of like the dogs and stuff that he, he like comes across in the movie. And he's great with the horses and stuff too. I really kind of loved any of those parts where he got to act with the animals. And that little boy, he's a little much. And frankly, if my mother had a big old, uh, whatever you'd call that mansion she lived in, I think I'd stay. I don't think I'd go with Dwight Yoakam, who's kind of sketchy back in the United States, but there you are. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get answered. You have a lot of questions about where they are. And the, your hope is that after this part is over, that Clint goes back to the gal that's at the Bridges of Madison County restaurant, and they're happy together for the rest of their lives, which might not be long. Chris, what did you think? I thought it was fine. I mean, it seems at this point that Clint Eastwood is just making movies out of compulsion, which is not necessarily to knock the quality of any of the films. He still has all this stuff locked up inside of him that needs to come out. To a certain degree, it seems like filmmaking is a personal therapy in a way for him. I mean, it was fine. What if he had cast somebody else, though, in the role? I feel like it needed to, to have him in it. I'm sure that he could have directed someone to, to do it, but it has that much more gravitas when you know that it's him directing the film and him starring in it. And because he's starring in it, he brings all of the connection that you have to Clint Eastwood of Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood of the Spaghetti Westerns. Uh, you know, going all the way back that you wouldn't have had with someone else. What if Tommy Lee Jones played it? I'm not saying that Clint needed to play this for us. I'm saying Clint needed, Clint needed to play it for himself. And it's, it's a better movie because of it. But I don't expect him to get any Oscar nominations necessarily. I don't see that happening for acting or for directing, partly because we've done the Clint Eastwood victory lap so many times over thinking that, you know, that's it. And then he keeps coming out with, <laughs> with movies that are, it's going to be a crapshoot whenever you have a body of work that large. And yeah, I don't know. I saw on Twitter uh, earlier, some, someone posted like an anonymous thing. Oh Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, they said uh, earlier this year, I worked on a studio funded feature with big name director and talent. I want to say at least 90% of the time we were wrapped well before lunch at the usual six hour mark. Many times we not only finished the day schedule, but shot ahead of schedule or even reshot previous work. Apparently this type of shooting schedule is normal for this director. It makes a monumental difference when they know what they want and how to accomplish it. Yep. Which, I mean, you can take that two ways. I mean, on the one hand, you have someone who's on set and can say that this is someone who knows what they want and knows how to get it. Or on the other hand, maybe he's just lazy. But I, I really don't think that that's the case. But, you know, the visuals are good. It looks good. Yeah, that was another thing I responded to. Like, especially, I think it's once they're in that one Mexican town and, like, you see Clint coming out of, like, the stable or whatever. And, it like, you know, he's, like, bathed in light and everything like that. That, that was the kind of stuff, too, that I was really happy to see in the movie. And the music is good. Yeah. So there, it's, it's not a, a wash where you go, I don't enough. But I really would like to see him direct somebody else. And I guess maybe he doesn't have the time. He knows what he wants, so I can just deliver it. I'll do it. Instead of me talking Robert Redford through how to do this. Here's an interesting thought that I had. If this had come out in normal times, where it was only in theaters for two or three months, however long before it hit rental on VOD, would there have been a push for uh, all these think pieces about that victory lap that I was talking about? Whereas because it's on HBO Max, as well as in theaters, and you know, I think the big screen would help, but because it's on HBO, it makes it that much easier for us to treat it as this was good, but it wasn't great. And it's Clint being Clint, as opposed to having all of the promotional bombast that would have to go with a film coming out in theaters. In theaters, it would have done really well because grandma and grandpa would go. To be clear, I totally think that it would have done fine. I think it's more just with the conversation around the film then they would bring in the, this brings us full circle because he's confronting what he did in his early years. He's commenting on the idea that this machismo that you have um, maybe at an early age, maybe that isn't what you need to really have to get through life. And so there might've been more kind of examinations of Clint's career and what it means now. And I think now move on. The review in uh, Vulture I thought was pretty good. The the last paragraph kind of talked about some of this and basically said, uh, now approaching twilight, Eastwood has stripped everything down to its essentials. The picture doesn't always work, but it works when it has to. It's a fragile enterprise, lovely to bask in, but liable to fall apart if you stare too hard. The same could be said for its actor. He's part of the illusion. Somehow when we look at Mike, we don't see Eastwood, the 91-year-old actor, but Clint, the icon, not so much ageless as preserved in weathered glory, cinema's forever haunted cowboy which i thought did a good job of getting at some of that but yeah, i was a little surprised there wasn't maybe some more of those kind of pieces like that for this movie i'd like to see him as a as the mean old man at the nursing home i'm sure that's on the way it could be after the musical he'll be in the uh the bucket list too kicking it boogaloo he was second choice to play dear evan hansen <laughs> <laughs> sorry no, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't know where we're going to be able to go with Cry Macho past that. Now, you've got to talk to me about Tammy Faye, because I have not seen it. I, it was right up there on my list, and we didn't get it. It opens today here, so I will be there right away tonight. I went and saw Isaac Tammy Faye at a Alamo Draft House, which Alamo, one of the things, is curating a whole bunch of uh, pre-screening video. And when we walked in, we were watching a collection of Jim Baker present day in Branson, Missouri, selling buckets. Yes. These, these enormous bucket. buckets that he's selling. So that, that was kind of, you know, alluding to where, where he's at. And uh, that, I mean, yeah. What he's doing with the buckets, I don't know. It's the end of time. You have to have food ready. They have a whole song about that. You can, if you go on YouTube, there's a song called end times and it's to the tune of my girl this is on like present day jim baker show from a couple years ago where like someone is just singing about the different types of food buckets they have again to the tune of my girl and the chorus is like talking about end times end times but that's where he's at 
and and that's where he's always been is in that uh the kind of low gear of a charming grifter the film paints him in a pretty bad light it definitely adds a lot of context to tammy Faye. if anybody needs any any history on this jim and tammy Faye baker were a married couple who were televangelists very early on when televangelism was in its earliest phases they had a satellite up there beaming out, you know, 24 hour Bible shows across America. And he and her have a PTL, which is Praise the Lord, which is their organization funding everything. He is embezzling all this money. He's got a lot of ducks getting moved around uh, to cover his debts and then ends up going to prison. You know, he serves his time, comes out, moves to Branson, Missouri. The film stars Andrew Garfield. And Jessica Chastain as Tammy Faye. And man, I just really wanted more. Tammy Faye's life doesn't fit stock biopic structure, both in real life and in the film. There isn't a lot of contrition on her part. She kind of has a lot of plausible deniability, plausible doing a lot of heavy lifting there. And There were moments where I could really see Jim Baker in Andrew Garfield, and there were a handful of moments where I could see Jessica Chastain as Tammy Faye, but otherwise, she just has so much makeup caked on, and Tammy Faye had a very square jaw, and Jessica Chastain does not, and so they had to add a lot of, I think last week I referred to them as appliances, and I don't know if that's the technical term for what's going on there but yeah she's under a lot of makeup did they have any of the songs that she uh, sang when she was on ptl oh yeah like we're blessed or any of those kind of things yep yeah there's an entire subplot with her and the producer of the albums that that she was putting out vincent d'onofrio is pretty good as jerry falwell and i will say so last week my sincere hope that they were going to have some kind of a recreation of Jerry Falwell going down a water slide in a full suit. Oh, does he? No, he does not in the film, which is such a bummer. But guess who does make an appearance, although he doesn't talk about polyps? Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders is on the show, um, but does not talk about polyps, which revisit last week's episode if you want to hear Jared giving uh, a lot more context on that. So yeah, Eyes of Tammy Faye, it was good. Well, then, you know, there was talk that Andrew and and Jessica could be nominated. Is that like out of the water? I don't think that's going to work. I've been wrong in the past after seeing something once. I've misjudged the general popular reaction to something, but I don't see it in the cards for her. I just don't. Okay. Miscast. Again, it's where you have, she's a producer and she gets to choose what she wants to do, but I... I, t- I told you that uh, uh, Kristen Chenoweth. Kristen Chenoweth has been trying to put this together for years, and she would have been perfect as Tammy Faye. Perfect. She could have sung it. She would have had the look. She's little like Tammy Faye, and I don't. Jessica Chastain does not look little to me. So, there you have it. Um, can I mention one that I I watched over the weekend that has a very similar feel to it? It's a documentary on Amazon called Lula Rich, and it's about the people behind the Lula Row um, leggings and kind of pyramid scheme thing that you know they've got going. And I don't. Are you familiar with Lula Row? They're it's kind of casual leisure at leisure wear, um, and they they started this, for lack of a better term, pyramid scheme where you would sell, and then you'd get other people underneath you to sell, and then more people would sell. And you'd be selling this. And it's fascinating to see how this built. And it's still, people are still buying these leggings. They think they're cool. Um, But there's this whole kind of, wait a minute here, philosophy about the people who are buying in at $5,000 a pop to become independent contractors. And it's a great little, the people who are running the company sit for an interview. So it's not like they're trying to pull anything over on anybody, but it does show you how we we want something to be that magic thing that'll save us from poverty, save us from some kind of a situation that we think we're in. 
And they talk to many of these women who are the retailers who, um, you know, say, I had no, I had to borrow the money to be able to buy in and get the stuff. And then how it kind of turns on them because they're not feeding their people as well as they should. To bring it back to Eyes of Tammy Faye, that is my biggest problem. Like the closest that the film gets to really wrestling with the the crimes that they were committing and, and the real victims is just like a montage of, you know, people taking calls and writing down, you know, $1,500, you know, 20 and the money rolling through a money counter, right? Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't really grapple with the fact that so many, I mean, primarily elderly people with, you know, who had the best of intentions were fleeced in a way that both Tammy Faye and obviously to a greater degree, Jim Baker were part of and were complicit in. If the point of the film is to try and humanize one of these people, and you've only got like two hours to do it in, you can't present a nuanced way. And also if in reality, there wasn't a, an apology tour in real life that wrestled with, you know, the fact that many families and, you know, generational legacies were destroyed by, by what they were doing uh, around America and around the world. This would have been a cuter story, I think, if they had done it like Itania. I think it would have worked better. And you look at the Righteous Gemstones, and that is just so cool because it, it attacks this kind of uh, greediness that people have and yet kind of pokes fun at them. So you don't feel like, you know, I did send them $10. Am I really an idiot for doing that? I think you can laugh with them instead of, you know, at, at yourself. But I'm still waiting. I'm going to see it. I definitely recommend seeing it. I just, I think I I was frustrated with the depiction. It is based on a documentary that came out, I think in the early 2000s, also called Eyes of Tammy Faye, uh, which they get a credit. The the two filmmakers who made that, you know, early on, I just don't have those names in front of me right now. Benton Bailey is one of them. It was an enjoyable experience, but it just didn't get into what it could have. The other movie that I saw, which is actually out today on Amazon Prime, is Birds of Paradise, directed by Sarah Adina Smith, who previously has done a movie called, well, she did one of the segments in a holiday-themed horror anthology. She did the Mother's Day-themed chunk of that, which involved a bunch of witches, and she also did a movie starring Rami Malek called Buster's Mall Heart, which is one of the worst movie names maybe in the history of cinema. That's on Netflix and is pretty good. Kind of a a psychological trippy thriller type thing. And Birds of Paradise is in the vein of Suspiria and Black Swan. I mean, in that it is a coming of age teenage girl, sapphic, semi love story, semi ghost story set in a ballet school in France. It stars Diana Silvers, who, if you saw Booksmart, she was the tall, cool chick in the fringe jacket who has the kind of over the top. I don't want to say gross out, but, uh, you know, sex scene towards the end. And Christine Froseth, who is a actress slash model, because, of course, you have to have an actress slash model in a movie about teenage ballet dancers. It's also got Jacqueline Bissett from Casino Royale, Bullet, Bullet, yeah, and a hundred other classic films. Airport. Yep. Yeah, she goes back, but yeah, she's not a friendly sort all the time. She'll tell you what she thinks. So just know. Yeah, that is on Amazon Prime. Everybody's talking about Jamie too. Is supposed to be on Amazon. Mm-hmm. This was a British stage musical that got great reviews. So we'll see what it looks like here. And they did recast. Pretty slow week, I think, honestly, for for movies. We've got Birds of Paradise and Dear Evan Hansen are the two big ones. But yeah, it's just those two. So Jared chose the the staff pick section today. I'll let Jared introduce that. 
I figured it'd be a good time to go back to some uh, anniversary stuff. And this is uh, not necessarily the most monumental of uh, anniversaries, but I think it's one that lends itself to a good little discussion. And uh, 20 years ago, uh, in a couple days, actually, is the uh, anniversary of Zoolander from uh, 2001, which, of course, uh, Ben Stiller directed. And I feel like that, along with, uh, I guess, old school is what, the year before that, maybe? Like, those, you know, a couple of movies, and then obviously Anchorman also, like, were kind of the ones that really ushered in that era of uh, comedy. And so I figured uh, we may as well talk about uh, some of our favorite uh, Ben Stiller flicks, either ones he uh, directed or ones that he was kind of the the lead in. Bruce, you got any uh, any favorite Ben Stiller? Meet the Parents. What about the sequels, uh, Bruce? Yeah, I'm not so sure about them. I think he's good in small doses. I don't like him in large sweeps of things because I I think I'm called a, a, you it calls attention to the kind of the quirks of him, and I don't know that like that um oh the uh there was a remake that he did Walter Mitty yeah dreadful dreadful and I don't think he can play that kind of a a role but in small doses he's going to be great as a father in shows I think he'll be really good you know and that's his parents too his parents were in small doses and they worked really really well um I saw him on Broadway in um the House of Blue Leaves, and he played this kind of manic guy, and he was really, really good, but I don't see him as a leading man at all. So when you look at some of those pictures where he is the star, it's like, mm, not so much. The movie that I would pick of his is The Cable Guy that he directed, produced by Judd Apatow, directed by Ben Stiller. Obviously, it is starring Jim Carrey, and I think that was the first like $20 million role that he ever got Matthew Broderick's fantastic in that Leslie man. I mean, it's stellar film. Also that came out 25 years ago to make old people feel that much older. Where do we feel like his career is going? Cause it seems like he's got a lot of bigger dramatic things that are in the pipeline. He's in the new PTA movie. I know. I mean, he did the Showtime series escape at Danamara based on a true story. And then he's got a, like a biopic type thing about Spiro Agnew that's coming out. It seems like he's kind of drifting into sort of like Adam McKay territory a little bit. I mean, the secret life of Walter Mitty, we already talked about. He's one of those people now that's in like Noah Baumbach's like coterie of uh, actors or whatever. So he'll show up in another Noah Baumbach movie at some point, I'm sure. Did you have a pick, Jared? I was tempted to go ahead and say Cable Guy because I've talked about how much I uh, love that movie. Another one from a couple years ago that was actually pretty good and it was definitely him in the role of like dad type of a guy was one from 2017 called uh, Brad Status where he's basically like helping his son navigate trying to get into uh, college. Very low stakes in terms of like drama but it was just a good uh, movie and a good use of him in like a, a dad type of role. So I, I was a fan of that one more than like even some of the Noah Baumbach stuff where he's also this like, you know, Gen X dad or whatever. So, yeah, that one's worth checking out. Which obviously with him uh, directing Reality Bites, he's got that Gen X card that he can bust out at any moment. Yep. Another one I completely forgot about was Along Came Polly with him and Jennifer Aniston, a little romantic comedy. Co-starring Philip Seymour Hoffman. One of my favorite roles of his. One of the the least seen things of his, because it it was a pilot for a show that didn't get picked up. Uh, It was a show called Heat Vision and Jack, written by Dan Harmon long before Community. Him and his writing partner, Rob Schraub. Have you ever heard of this show, Bruce? No. It's one of the most bizarre, like, pilots ever. It's kind of ripping off uh, Knight Rider but even more insane. Uh, Jack Black plays a astronaut who is accidentally uh, sent up on some mission where he ends up getting superpowers, where it's just a, he gets really, really smart, but only in the sun. And so if it's dark, he's dumb. And he's always wearing his his astronaut outfit. Uh, Owen Wilson is his roommate who has been turned into a motorcycle. And so it's a talking motorcycle voiced by Owen Wilson. 
And the bad guy is Ron Silver. Not Ron Silver playing a character, but it is Ron Silver as himself to the point where there will be scenes where Ron Silver is doing his like bad guy thing and somebody in the background would just kind of go, hey, aren't you the bad guy from Time Cop? Like, <laughs> It's not surprising that it never got picked up for a show, but it it's just a strange product of a different time. It was probably, though, during during a time where they were pitching it to a network and a network wouldn't care for something like that. But if they had a streaming service like they do now, it would have a home. Oh, yeah. The pilot got created or ordered by uh, Fox. And yeah, now if that, that had happened, like this definitely would have gotten on some kind of streaming platform for sure. So that's the staff picks. We got some good stuff. And now news. Did you have any, um, any news that was jumping out at you, Bruce? I was just going to talk about the Emmy Awards. You know, there was a big thing in Hollywood to try and make a deal out of Oscar Emmy so white, but it didn't really hold weight because all of the the Emmy Emmys in performance, guest performance, and you know, voiceovers and things like that, all were all went to black performers. So I don't know if somebody was trying to start something there or what that was. Um, the thing I think they never they never look at is there were so many British winners. What does this say about American television? Are, isn't anybody picking up on that? But that was the thing that just struck me this week was that somebody was trying to get a little um, thing going by talking about Emmy So White. And it was just, you know, the categories they put on air. Michaela Cole is held up as the one of the few examples of a person of color who, you know, won during the televised uh, chunk. She was nominated for everything, um, for acting, writing, directing, producing, you know, and with that kind of a, uh, an insular project, you can probably win one of them, but I don't know that you'd win all of them. Bo Burnham was big this year too. And they he was nominated for like six Emmys. He didn't get six Emmys. Nobody made a deal about that, but I'm glad that she won because there were a, a lot of female writers who won and they should have been celebrating that. Two female directors won, which when you have three or four directing awards, that says something. My news is gonna be a bit of a capper because it's a little bit bonkers, but uh, Jared, you can jump in. Basically here are some numbers uh, about uh, box office numbers. Uh, since May uh, 2021, when films grossed only 19% of the same month's earnings two years prior, uh, improvements at the box office have been dramatic. Uh, in June, the ratio improved to 35% of earnings from two years prior. In July, it was 45%. In August, it was 50%. Through last weekend, September was 75% of box office totals from 2019, although the month will likely end around 65%. And then what the IndieWire article goes on to get into is that there's every reason to, th there's, there's good reason to think that that uh, percentage will go up even more in October because we're getting stuff like Venom. Uh, no Time to Die, uh, The Adams Family, which I know the, the last one of those was pretty popular, and of course, Dune and uh, Halloween Kills. So um, numbers are starting to tick back up for the box office, and it seems like October is a month pretty well positioned to tick up even more. Yeah, I'm wondering if Paramount, which moved Jackass, and oh, what was the other one that got moved around the same time? Uh, Mission Impossible and also uh, Top Gun. Yeah. I'm wondering if they're having second thoughts and they're going to bump those back up or maybe we're still waiting to kind of see what kind of noise that this canary is going to make or not make in the James Bond coal mine. I mean, it's, it seems like things are getting more healthy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to theaters. You guys are going to theaters, but I haven't seen the, the next little thing that you've got Jared. So blast us with, uh, with the big trailer release of the week. It's the, Teaser for the tragedy of uh, Macbeth, which is the uh, movie that uh, Joel Cohen directed uh, by himself. No Ethan Cohen this time out, which obviously it's the first time that's been the case. The cast in this is stacked. I, of course, anyone that was keeping tabs on this knew that Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand were going to be in it. I guess for some reason I didn't realize that like Brendan Gleeson is also going to be in it, which is fantastic. I know he's going to be uh, great in this movie as uh, King Duncan. Uh, Ralph Innocent, who people might know from The Witch or from uh, The British Office, 
is also in it. And uh, Stephen Root is also going to be in uh, The Tragedy of Macbeth, which, I mean, he's been great in other Coen Brothers movies he's popped up in, not just No Country, but also, of course, O Brother, Where Art Thou? So um, very excited for that movie. The Like I said, the cast is stacked. You got Joel Cohen uh, directing, I, and A24 is the distributor on it. So uh, an embarrassment of riches all around. I'm intrigued to see if this has any sort of palpably different feel to it than Hail Caesar, because that was the last one, I think, where it was a standard approach to, to filmmaking. And not that Buster Scruggs wasn't, but Buster Scruggs is an anthology series, basically. Anyway, the little bit of news that I've got is uh, was announced late last night. Mario, <laughs> Super Mario, <laughs> Nintendo's Mario <laughs> of Mario and Luigi fame has a movie coming out, drafting off the success of Detective Pikachu and Sonic the Hedgehog. And I presume it'll have similar approach with a mixture of real life and CGI. They have announced a big time cast with Chris Pratt as the voice of Mario, which seems, uh, I mean, bad. It's bad. Don't don't pull any punches. It's It's dumb. So, I don't know. Anya Taylor-Joy as Princess Peach. Charlie Day as Luigi. Jack Black as Bowser. And the Charlie Day one as Luigi is fine. And I think the Seth Rogen thing as Donkey Kong is also fine. But I do appreciate people's suggestions that if you're going to have Charlie Day be Luigi, just have Danny DeVito be Mario. Come on, man. He's like, it's right there for you. <laughs> I'm not saying that I have low expectations for the film as a movie, but I will say that Chris Pratt as Mario is setting a very low bar <laughs> for it to get over. If, if they can, if they can even come close to sticking the landing with Chris Pratt as Mario, then it's going to be a big win. I'm all the way out. Great. Although I don't know what would have got me to be in on this, but it's definitely not having Chris Pratt as Mario. Is he going to do an affected voice? Chris Pratt doing the it's a me Mario. <laughs> I bet he will. That's, um, yeah, yeah, there's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thumbs down on a lot of that. <sighs> um, yeah, as always. Yes. We'll let Jared take us out. Look, uh, if you ever find yourself one day and you're roaming through a forest and you come upon a trio of witches and they, they give you some kind of prophecy that might sound really promising about how one day you're going to be the, you know, the king of Scotland or you're going to be the, I don't know, the manager of whatever, like mid-level marketing company you work for or so, whatever. You know, you get this great uh, prophecy. It sounds really good. You don't want to run off right away and start trying to make that come true. Instead, you need to get your head right. You need to drive to your local cinema or uh Orpheum or whatever the hell they had back in uh, the Middle Ages, maybe a Nickelodeon, depending on what time these uh, witches are coming to you during. And you need to go and see something good. And that will get your head right and you will maybe prevent yourself from uh, having tragedy befall you. See something good. Thank you guys, as always. I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Bruce, looking forward to hearing your take on Eyes of Tammy Faye. I will be watching. And I'm going to go rewatch Heat Vision and Jack. Perfect. Well, that is the end of the episode. Next week is going to be pretty overstuffed. What with Venom, Let There Be Carnage, finally hitting theaters. The Many Saints of Newark landing on HBO Max. And the new Jake Gyllenhaal movie, The Guilty, premiering on Netflix. You can check the show notes for links to where you can stream the movies that we talked about, discover older episodes, and find ways to contact Bruce, Jared, and myself as well if you want. The show is produced by myself, Bruce, and Jared, and I am the one who records and edits it. We hope you enjoy the show and are taking very good care of yourselves out there. As always, thank you so much for listening. Kristen Chenoweth!